Professor Riley, I know it's not a simple relationship where cases grow and then you can figure out what the deaths will be along the path. Are we any smarter in that linkage from March? Yeah, I mean, Tom, I think I think that we are. I, and I and I think that you know, we can make a lot, if you look at the current epidemic curve for the US, we can make some of the same points now that we were making in March. So um, the deaths that we're, that we're seeing come through now are from infections and cases two to three weeks ago. And that's a very different time in the epidemic. If you look at that current curve, it's it's been growing very rapidly. So what we're going to expect is that the deaths in two to three weeks from now will be substantially higher and will reflect that very recent growth in cases. So I, th I think we do know that relationship, Tom. You are the best in the world at this question. There are high density urban areas like New York, like Delhi in India, indeed the challenges of Tokyo right now. What changes when a virus goes to the hinterlands of Kansas or Texas or some remote island in Indonesia? What happens when a virus goes rural? So I, I think that right now it's when the virus comes into different populations, we see the population respond differently. So the, around the world, many large cities where the, the virus will thrive, the, the people in those cities, for example, New York and London, have, have adhered to pretty strong lockdowns. And, and they've managed, their behavior has managed to reduce um, transmission really quickly. So, and then what we're seeing, you know, perhaps at the moment, you know, subject to some more evidence is, is we're seeing that people in those Southern states have chosen not to change their behavior in the same way those people in the cities did choose to change their behavior. So that, that seems to be the main factor that's leading to this growth in cases in those um, less densely populated. It's, it's, it's the way that the people are responding to the presence of the virus. Professor Riley, it's pretty hot in Texas right now. It's pretty hot in Florida. People are eating and drinking inside. What lessons can we learn about what is happening in those states that we can apply to when it gets cold in the Northeast in the United States and here in Europe? Will it be possible to eat and drink indoors? I, I, think, I think, Guy, that's a really good question. We, all the evidence that we have says that it's going to be easier for the virus to transmit once we're spending more time indoors. And you're right, that could very well be a factor um, in the southern states at the moment. Um, I think what we, we have to see exactly what level of transmission we're at when people do start to spend more time indoors. People have to wear masks so that we get a, a good look about whether they do make a, a bit of a difference. And then we'll have choices to make. If we will figure out pretty quickly how much that indoor behavior is contributing to transmission when it starts to occur in places like the UK. And then as a, as a society, as a population, we're going to have to prioritize indoor activity. We're going to have to look at bars and restaurants versus schools and, and other key activity that takes place indoors. And we're going to have to prioritize, I think. What do we need to do just from a kind of environmental point of view? Is there a way of replicating outside, <coughs> inside? Is it about ventilation? Is it about UV? I, as you say, these are going to be applicable both in terms of sort of bars and restaurants, but also critically in schools. It, all of those things, we know, we know what helps. We know that more ventilation is better. I'm not sure on the evidence for UV, <coughs> but we know those things help. What we don't know is how much they help. So more ventilation is definitely better, but we're going to have to do a lot of work to figure out what the safest, the safest ways are to be indoors and how we can, and how we can um, kind of constantly improve. I think keeping an eye on it, generating really good data and constantly improving the level of COVID security indoors is, is what we're going to have to do. Uh, Professor Riley, Megan is my floor manager this morning and she wants me with my mask on. I'm back in the office and they've got great protocol here, but I'm not wearing my mask, folks, because it fogs up my, my glasses. But Professor Riley, seriously, you know, I'm making a joke of it, folks, in this tragedy, but how critical is it in a contained TV studio like this to have my mask on? My, my mask on? Megan wants to know now. I, 
I, like everybody else, I'm adapting my habits to both the way people feel around me and the best scientific evidence. And indoors, I'm trying to wear a mask all the time when I'm with people who are not inside my bubble. That there is, it's not going to hurt and it's definitely going to help to some degree. And I think it's also just a, a clear sign. We've got to make a sign to each other that we take yeah. it seriously. We're doing everything we can. So I'm wearing a mask whenever I can now when I'm indoors with people who are not in my kind of immediate family. Yeah, Megan makes clear she's decidedly not inside my bubble. I'm actually getting used to the mask, and you hope the president of the United States is as well. What is the symbolism, Professor Riley, that if President Trump can wear a mask at Walter Reed, that if he was to do it more repetitively, would he lose his manhood on that? What's, what's your view on the urgency that leaders uh, show that they're wearing uh, masks? I thought President Trump looked, in, uh, looked very strong walking around the, the hospital with a mask on. And I thought he showed very high levels of respect to the people within the environment that he was visiting. That was the, that was the image. That was the sense that I got from seeing those images on my TV.